<clears throat> Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nick Roy. I'm the webinar host. If you have any issues today during the webinar, technical difficulties, you can send me a message in the chat box or in the Q&A, and usually I can, I can be a little bit of help. Um, also, during the webinar, if you have questions about the content, feel free and send those questions to me, again, in a chat or in a Q&A. I will hold them all till the very end, and then we'll uh, present them all to Bill to hopefully get to them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, William Jensen to present uh, the Parenting Through Tough Kid Moments. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks. You can hear me, right, Nick? Nick, you can hear me, right? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, just a little paranoid there. This is Bill Jensen. Um, I'll be taking you to the webinar. Thank you for showing up to listen to it. I'm sitting here in sunny Salt Lake City on a winter's day with my miniature Australian shepherd pup who's going to help me go through this. What I thought I'd like to do in this webinar is to take you through the development of our parent training program and how it's evolved and the research behind it and what separates different parent training programs because there's several parent training programs out there. Uh, believe it or not, this parent training program took 35 years to develop when I was a much younger PhD and the principal of a school for emotionally disturbed students, we developed this, started it out way back then, way before I went to the university. And it was designed and used out of Salt Lake Mental Health for basically single moms that had real tough kids and not a lot of resources. So over the years, we have really tried to hone this in. And about every year after we would run about 100 parents, uh, what we would do is go through and refine it, and I'll show you a little bit how we did that as we go along. So let me start off. It's called Parent, uh, Parenting Through Tough Kid Moments. It used to be the Tough Kid Parenting Book, but we realized from our feedback that a lot of parents that didn't have kids that met the, the basic standard clinical levels would, could also use this, and we're using it when we looked at our remarks, particularly on Amazon. So this is the front, and it is part of the Tough Kid series. Uh, basic definition of parent training is a systematic teaching of behavior management skills to parents to be used in the home environment. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And our parent training program is geared specifically for externalizing disorders. Now, as I said, you know, if you have a child and they're having some difficulties with compliance or arguing and they're not at the high clinical levels, this program still helps, but this was designed for really difficult, tough kids, externalizing disorders, which means their behavior affects others external to them, particularly teachers, parents, siblings, and peers. And they come with all these definitions you see on your screen, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, often defiant disorder, conduct disorder. So I'm less interested in the labels than our general definition, which I'll give you as we go along here. There are three basic types of parenting groups. Now these are the three basic kind of uh, Jeeps, Chevys, and Fords out there. The first type is family communications and relationship building. Um, there was some research on that, but not real credible research for externalizing disorders. The second type of parent training group is what we call a, a clinic-based two-phase model. And this is run out of a clinic where uh, parents come in, there's a one-way uh, uh, mirror in a room that child and parent are put in there and they, they, they're given a bug in the ear and they are coached by the uh, professional outside of the room and I'll go a little bit more on what those two stages are. The last one here is a group formatted uh, parent training program and that's the one that we'll be talking about today and that's what's in the book. Uh, all this goes back and uh, to a lady named Constant Hamp in who late 60s presented the first parent training programs at the University, excuse me, British Columbia Psychological Association. And she sort of set this whole thing off. Now, it's called Hamp's two-stage intervention. And the, the basic standard parenting programs that we'll present today, either the group or the clinic, are based on these two stages. The first stage is to bring parents in and enhance the parent's responsiveness to the child, really increase the positives to that child, and not give any discipline or any negative feedback. And that's run until we get high rates of positives to the child. And again, they're coached between, you know, one-way mirror and they're in the room with their child only. The second stage, after they've established the positives, 
is to really give them instructional skills, social reinforcement for compliance to the child, uh, warnings for non-compliance, which is the five-second rule, which has existed since constant uh, hand developed that, and a mildly adverse consequences for, for a non-compliance, like timeout. So first stage positive, second, very descriptive uh, commands that you give your child, followed up by reasonable consequences. And these are the big ones that are out there of this two-stage clinic model. This is helping the non-compliant child by Rex Forehand and, and uh, Bob McMahon, it's an excellent book. And this is one a lot of people are, are familiar with, which is parent-child interaction therapy. Now, these are the data, if we look at it just briefly, on compliance using this model. And it's a pretty effective model when you look at it, because if you look, this is compliance, percent compliance, and we're generally looking about from 20 to 40 percent compliance. And you can see at baseline, the kids in, these pro in the program are, are very non-compliant. Uh, at stage one, where we're just using positives, you can see that does not change compliance very much. When you move into stage two, it makes a big difference. But that's one model. Now, uh, let me see here. Let's move this up a little bit. Uh, there we go. The advantages and disadvantages with this. Well, if you're using this model, a child is there. You can give them real-time coaching. You can model it for them, treats one child at a time. But you lose a lot of the group synergy, and it costs a lot of money to train one parent and a child at a time. And it focuses on compliance basically only. Other programs, particularly the group programs, have broader curriculums, and we'll talk about that. So this is a costly program. It's effective, but it's costly if, you, if your needs are to run it out of a clinic. Group parent training teaches parents in a format, a group format. The child isn't present. Uh, parents are given homework assignments. There's a defined number of meetings, and it includes a broader curriculum for parenting. Generally, uh, it includes compliance. It may have a school component to it, and it may have uh, basic duties and disciplines in the home. A lot of these programs do, and this is the one we'll be talking about today because this is the one we use and have used for many years. Common components uh, that we find in all these programs, as I've said, we want to increase the positives before we do anything else. We want to increase the positives because there's generally a negative interaction between the parent and the child by the time they come to see us. We want them to objectively define target behaviors. Bad attitude, poor responsibilities is not what we want. We want explicit definitions of compliance. Uh, we explain coercion to them, precision requests. We introduce them later into reductive consequences. And as I said, we can expand out to other household duties and rules and in interfacing with the schools. Now, going on with this, I don't think hardly anybody can see this, but I put this slide together and it goes through basically the, the most popular programs out there for parent training for externalizers. And what you can just see is they all have very similar components, defining uh, the target behaviors explicitly, learning how to reinforce your child, having very precision requests to the child, and limit setting as we go along. So, and these are the common uh, basic approaches for the group formatted books, aside from ours, as families living with children. Uh, Lynn Clark's books are wonderful. Howard Sloan's book is great. Uh, Kasdan's book, One, Two, Three Magic, is an excellent book. And um, what happens with these programs is when you get to about 13, they become far more problematic. So our program runs from preschool up to about, oh, I'd say 11 or 12. There are some resources out there, and the Defiant Child by Russell Barkley and the Defiant Teens is a really good option. And this is probably the best option out there if you have adolescents. This is out of the Gerald Patterson University of Oregon model. Okay, moving a little bit here. Okay, the effectiveness of parent training. Um, I'm going to take you through and just bore you a little bit with what a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is a, uh, a very intensive review of the research literature, and it generally goes from 10 to 20 years, and it boils down to what's the magnitude of the effect and how effective are they. So a meta-analysis for externalizing disorders, parent training, would include parents, of course, externalizing disorder kids, reduction of noncompliance, and uh, then we would quantify it. And how we quantify it here is what we call an effect size. 
And you can see the baseline. Let's say that's, that's noncompliance. We implement our uh, parent training intervention. We reduce it. And the magnitude of effect is on the right. And that's called an effect size. And it's used in medicine. It's used uh, in psychology to judge basic drugs, uh, medical procedures, psychological procedures. But based on a normal curve, look at it quickly here, and I'll make sure I go this so I don't kill anybody. Uh, if you look down at the bottom, it says zero, the z-score. We know if we can improve the compliance of one child by one standard deviation, and that could be judged by observers, could be judged by parents, could be judged by teachers, we improve that child's compliance behavior by 85%. Uh, Two standard deviations, it's almost 98, and three standard deviations, it's 99%. Now, I say this just to establish the effectiveness of these programs. And as I said, it's used by physicians. This is your basic standard pediatrician looking at uh, random uh, control trials for methylphenidate, and they use a meta-analysis. Oh, what am I doing here? Here we go. Okay, these are the two big meta-analyses on parent training for externalizing disorders. Uh, one by mom and one by circuit attach. I was involved with one of these. It really was an interesting thing to see. Now, if we can improve your behavior by one standard deviation, it's considered very large. As you can see on the screen, 0.85 is incredibly large. So when people say you can't work with the parents of externalizing disorder kids, they are absolutely wrong. When the parent judges it slightly less, when a teacher judges it, but even at follow-up. Now that means we can work with about 80% of the parents. It's going to leave 20% of parents that are going to be difficult in these groups. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about them in a second, but we generally pick these parents up as an individual case and try to work with them. They're not going to do as well in a parent training group. And the advantages to the program I'm talking about when a group format is it's more cost effective. You get an incredible synergy from the groups when you put parents together in the evening and they talk about their child. It dawns on them that they're not the only parent in the universe that has a child like this. And there's actually a bonding that goes on. Uh, the homework assignments, broader curriculum, almost all of these programs, group formatted programs, are, uh, have a manual or a book that goes with them. What's, what's not uh, advantageous is the child is not present. You have to rely on a parent report, and it doesn't allow you to do coaching. Now, there's nothing in this world that says you cannot b combine both of these programs, the basic uh, clinic-based with a group-based program, but not many people do that. Not many people do that that I know. Okay, I said 20% of parents you're going to have difficulty working with. Now, these are the, these are the types or the 20% of parents you're going to have difficulty with. As I indicated before, our parent group grew out of a mental health center serving uh, a single moms generally with a number of children at the poverty line or, or below it with not a lot of resources and not a lot of help. And they're called insular mothers or overwhelmed mothers. They have a lot of negative contacts uh, with the community. And uh, since I've trained hundreds and worked with hundreds of these mothers, they are the salt of the earth. If they are given basic standard procedures, support, little reinforcement for what they're doing, they do masterfully well. But sometimes they can, they can be difficult because they, they have limited resources. Parent as a sibling is another one of those 20 percenters. And a parent as a sibling means they treat their children's equals. Uh, and basically, they're all siblings. And the parent is generally reluctant to set a limit because if they do, they offend their siblings and they're likely to lose their social network. And uh, how we've managed parents like that is to try to build an adult social network around them. The unattached parent is the basic, in my view, unabashed worst parent to deal with. These aren't parents that care, but they're incompetent. These are parents that just don't care about their kids. They treat them as objects. They are in, uh, well represented in the research literature. It's a form of abuse. And I have never been successful when an unattached parent who really is bothered by the child's presence, having in there. The next one is my child is special. You'll get one of these, which is generally to introduce the child, and second comes the child's diagnoses, Tourette syndrome, ADHD, conduct disordered, ASD. And what they want to do is to say, my child is special, so not a lot of this stuff will probably work with them. We've had great success with these parents over the years in introducing him to another parent who's gone through our parent training program with a child with exactly the same diagnosis. 
Uh, the next one is a funny one. You'll get these two. These are the perfect parents. These are the parents that come in and they do everything correctly, and they generally have a book they will tell you and ask you if you've read it, and they'll say, this book has saved my life, and it's just improved my parenting to no end. And I always like to say to them, then why are you in our parent training group? You kind of have to get them to abandon that approach and look at it differently. Next one is the misattribution parent. This is the parent that blames others, not their child. They will blame the ex-husband, they'll blame siblings, they'll blame the teachers, they'll blame the kids in the neighborhood. And this is a very difficult parent to work with because you have to get them to realize that the problem is not all everybody else, but the child has problems also. The sadomasochistic aberrest parent. Now that's a very fancy label, and all these types, by the way, are taken from a wonderful researcher named Gerald Patterson who wrote a lot about parenting and he called the sadomasochistic Arabic parent parents that da dance around each other and you got a parent in that situation that can't set a limit to save their life they really want to be associated with their children as siblings and then you've got another parent in that relationship who is extremely rigid extremely punishing and they fight in front of the child these are very difficult parents to work with, and they're most likely, you know, on their way to divorce. Okay, let me move on here a little bit. And Okay, parent training. Attrition is your worst enemy. If you start one of these groups, the standard group is a 50% attrition loss, 50%. So when we developed our program over the years, we really looked at attrition as a major problem and wanted to beat that. And uh, our basic standard rates for attrition hovered around 20% because we did a number of things. And uh, here are the, some of the things that we, we really tried to look at and not to lose parents. You gotta give them a real understanding of the child's behavior problem in the first meeting or they'll leave. They have to understand what's going on here and vague definitions, psychobabble, they're all ready for that. They've already gone through that. They want to know, you know, a very basic standard understanding of the problem. We also like to give them a, an indication of how severe these problems are going to be. They're not going to go away. They have to be intervened with. And the basic problems that we've, we focus in on are compliance, temper tantrums, arguing, and reducing them and building what we call habit builders, which is basic habits around the house that help the home. Uh, as, as much as I would like to say it because I'm a behavior analyst, uh, parents don't like to take data and they will not take a lot of data. So you have to kind of sneak it in when they don't even realize that they're doing it. Uh, the meetings have to be cost effective. We run them about six to 12 meetings. Uh, is a very cost-effective series of meetings. Some go to 16. Now, it really helps also if you have a sense of humor when you're dealing with parents because it sets them at ease. And they're coming the first night wondering about have they, have they caused this child's problems? How will they be looked at within the group? So a sense of humor sort of disarms them, and so does a sense of disclosure. I talked about my kids and said, you know, I'm not perfect by any measure. And parenting is a management strategy from day to day. And then also what we did, this book is designed so at the end of each chapter, it sort of introduces what's going to happen in the next chapter, sort of like a cheap continuing uh, movie where, you know, from one series to the next where they bring you back. And uh, it's very helpful for parents to know what's going to happen in the next session and not want to miss it. Uh, things they never tell you also in parenting books. These are just givens, and, you know, they may fit your, your situation or not. This parent training group started out, as I said, in the mental health center. It's been run in multiple, multiple school districts. It's been run in pediatric hospitals. Primary Children's Hospital here in the Valley is one that particularly uses it, and our neuropsychiatric institute hospital. Parents, their level of reading, their economic background varies. So some of the stuff you need to do, some of it you don't. But if you have an insular mother, it really helps if you can build in a, a social aspect into in your parent training because they don't have a lot of social contacts. We've even done potlucks with them and, you know, ask them to contribute to the potlucks. One thing I have to, to understand, a lot of my colleagues don't, is you've got a, you've got a parent who's got four children and you're asking them to come at seven at night, uh, 
it's difficult for them to have a babysitting resource. So you may not be able to do this, but we always wrangle it and got graduate students to do it in the sense that we would provide babysitting as long as they got their children there and we were in parent training. Transportation is another issue. Bus passes have, have increased this a lot. Uh, carpooling has made a big difference with this, and even carpooling with things like Uber or Lyft has helped. You know, it's just like your dentist. <laughs> if you want to cut attrition, call the night before and remind people. And we always put out a newsletter. It would go right out after the group talking about who was there, who wasn't there, the uh, problems that we had addressed in that meeting, uh, any social kind of indications we could put down there, and then what we were going to look at at the, the next meeting, what would, would be the, the skills that we would teach the next meeting. So these are things they don't tell you, but I think are really important, and also depending upon the level of your parent. Okay, let me see here. Why? Okay, let's go through, this is our book. Now, I think our program differs from the other group for the Matter programs in, an, in, in several different ways. Number one is we build a um, school to home interface. And not a lot of the parent training programs have a school to home interface. And we think this is very helpful because a lot of the teachers that your children will go through are familiar with the Tough Kid series and books. So we generally have a nice alignment there. Uh, one of the big problems that our parents reported to us is once the group stopped, how do they how do they generalize this to the next problem that was going to pop up? So we built in a component into this also for, you know, how do you generalize these skills to your next issue that you're going to face without us being there? And then we had things like teacher pleaser skills that parents could teach their child, because a lot of these kids go back with very devastating reputations, how to be a positive parent tutor to your, to your child, and how to head up, set up a homework system, and we'll talk all about that as we go through. Um, I'm going to probably miss, just go through this quickly. Uh, I've already gone through a lot of it. As you can see, it goes through habit builders. I've just said family school connections and teaching parents to generalize to new skills. It's eight chapters as we go through to teach each one of these, and since we're going to go through the chapters, I'm not going to read each one as we go through because we're going to go through each of the chapters here, and I'll tell you what goes on here. Okay, our first chapter is this, and what's interesting about the first night with parents in a parent training group, 7 p.m. and when you're doing it, is it's going to make you or break you. You're going to lose them that night, uh, or you're going to get them to come back, okay? And so in this chapter, we tell them, you know, what we're going to be able to do for them over time, the definition of a tough kid, what sticky behaviors are, and sticky behaviors are the behaviors that are not going to go away unless you intervene with them, unless you intervene. We introduce them to coercion, which I'll talk a little bit more when we get to the third and fourth chapters. But one thing is really important, uh, and that is to build up the group synergy the first night. And how we do that is have each parent introduce themselves and uh, talk about the age of the child, the sex of their child. And it's crucial we say, what do you like about the child? Because many of our parents come with a laundry list of things they want to change. And the first thing we want to do is to focus it and make it, it, make it positive. And what happens there is that other parents see that it's generally about four to one boys in our groups the, the problems are very similar, non-compliance, aggression, poor schoolwork, temper tantrums, and what have you. And then we like to give them a little bit of history of uh, child development and where children's difficulties come from. And this is an eye-opener for a lot of parents. And again, it's a unique aspect of this program. I don't believe there's one thing that causes childhood problems. I believe it's many things, like a chocolate chip recipe. And uh, a lot of it can be genetics. And a lot of our parents come to the, these groups thinking, I caused this problem. Uh, I'm a poor parent because we have this Gerber myth about parent training, which is if I do everything correctly, I'm going to get the Gerber baby. Well, you're not. And for those of you out there, all 37 of you that have more than one child, I bet no, not one person in that 37 have two children who are exactly the same behaviorally and temperamentally. That's funny because they live in the same home, they got the same parents, they eat the same food. There's a lot of individual differences that come up and we like to introduce our parents to this because it makes them feel comfortable. And we do this by discussing temperament. 
let me see here. Okay, here's our definition of the tough kid. And essentially it's the same across all of our books. Noncompliance uh, is high. Their, their compliance rate hovers around 40%, where the average child is around 80%. They have aggression and noncompliance, very poor self-management skills, poor self, uh, social skills are rejected by others, and they, about 80% of our kids have an academic failure, particularly in reading. So we like to go over that. I don't care what your label is, whether it's ADHD, conduct disorder, ODD, reactive attachment disorder, this is what we like to focus on because it really gives us areas where we can move for improvement. Here's what I'm talking about, about sticky behaviors. This is based on the Achenbach Child Behavior, Chair, uh, Sarah, uh, Child Behavior Checklist uh, uh, standardization data over many, many, many years showing which problems stick with you and which don't, okay? And uh, you can see what improves with, with age is whining, thumb sucking, uh, you know, excessive crying, uh, bedwetting. Uh, problems that will not go away, and this is an eye-opener for a lot of parents and teachers. Noncompliance is very stable. Aggression is very stable. Temper tantrums are incredibly stable. So these are things you're going to have to intervene with if you're going to change them. And then you have things that are not only going to stay the same, they're going to get worse, okay? This is poor performance, uh, poor choice of friends. So like this parents, this is what you have to focus in on if you really want to have a child in the long run. And then we talk about and we tell them that having a baby is like a capsule. And you just and you think you get the baby is like baby dice and turn up, you know, Bubba again. Now, we explain this to them in detail, and it's in the book. It's based on the research of Chess and Thomas out of New York City, where they looked at Teeny babies, that's where there's a baby on this slide. They're very young, you know, children. And what they did is they did nine characteristics, and some of you have probably used the Chess and Thomas uh, from and they can see differences in children on these nine basic elements, activity level, rhythmicity, is your approach with the intensive reaction, threshold of responsiveness, some of these Bill, I'd like to interrupt quickly. Um, we're getting kind of some bad reception for you. I'm wondering, are you connected via computer, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. If it continues, I might have you call in, Bill, and I'll, and I'll send you an email with the call-in information, and then I think you'll be a little bit more secure then. Okay. You mean for the cell phone, right? Yeah. Cell phone oh, or, or a yeah. landline. Okay, let's go, cell phone. Let's go. My lens on. Go. Okay. So uh, there's a uh, threat responsiveness, quality of mood. We uh, get very unpleasant. Some are pleasant. Distractibility, attention span, and see across the elements that uh, there's a lot of embedded behaviors that will will probably develop into things like ADHD, like poor attention span and distractibility. Now, when Chess and Thomas did this research, they found that when they took all the children and classed them, 40% fell into what we call the easy temperament range. And they were friendly, well-adapted, pleasant mood, cyclic, and accepted frustration. 15% were the slow to warm uppers. These are mild intensity. They adapt over time. And then you have 10% are difficult, and that's the children whose parents are generally in our parent training group. They're unpleasant, they cry a lot, they are irregular, and they react poorly to change. And then 35%, they just couldn't, they couldn't type, okay? They just couldn't type. And uh, out of the easy temperament children, only 18% develop school problems. Out of the difficult temperament children, 70%. Now, I'd like to say to the parents, you know, why would God do this to us? Why would we get difficult temperament children? And I read this research paper, and it's in the book. We put it right in there uh, about why we have difficult temperament children. And it's based on a study of temperament and Maasai warriors where this psychologist named DeVries went to Kenya to see if they had the same temperament breakdown with Maasais as they had with uh, children in New York City. And... The Maasai's live off of cattle, off the blood and milk they mix and eat. And DeVries found out the breakdown of temperament in these Maasai babies 
was about exactly what it was in New York City. But 40% were friendly, 15% were slow to warm up, 10% were difficult, and 35% he couldn't type. Now, if you look at this slide, he came back five lousy months later, and 95% of the cattle had died of this tribe. What he found was only one easy temperament infant was still alive, and every difficult temperament infant had survived. So we think there's a genetic loading for some of these behaviors. For, you know, we, we know that, that, you know, you can become aggressive, you'll argue, you'll temper tantrum, but you'll get the milk. And that might have survival value in some areas. We do this to help parents get off the hook of thinking they've caused everything because they haven't. They clearly have not. And if you're interested in the research on this, here it is. But it's also built right in the book, and we go over that the very first night. Um, the second chapter, we, we tell them the second time they come, we're going to talk about some really proactive strategies and how to select rewards and what we call I feed A rules. And this is the same model that everybody else uses. We want to make sure we can increase the positives to these children before we go into any adversive procedures. So when they come there, we teach them how to really effectively reward their child socially. We use what we call I feed AV rules. Immediately, frequently, do it with eye contact, enthusiasm, describe the behavior you want, build up anticipation, and uh, build in variety and variability if you can as we go along. And we give them lots of suggestions on things they can use later on in a program where we, we set up for habit builders, which are going to build in habits that they want in their child. And we also say the dollar store is just an excellent resource to take their children and have them select things that are minimally cost that will really work well in, uh, with the parent training group. Here's just some more reward suggestions. Now, this is the most hated exercise in this whole program. Now, remember I said parents don't like to take data, so you have to slip it in. So they're not going to go out and take a, uh, a compliance baseline for you to see how well you improve. They're not going to do that. But what we do is we ask them to leave that night and for the next week ask their child to come to them within 10 seconds when they're out of sight. So they would say, you know, Jeffrey, come here, please, and then wait 10 seconds. If the child comes, we check off yes. If they don't come, we check off no. Then we have them bring these data sheets to the, the very next meeting. And what we do is we add these up, and what's really intriguing is it just about comes out 50-50. 50% of the time the child will comply and come, and 50% they will not. And what we're doing is we're slipping in a compliance baseline there. So they all want to know how to remedy the, the come here problem. And it's very easily how you do it. Generally what you do is when you ask your child to come, they're doing something they enjoy. And you're asking them to come and do homework or wash the dishes. And we say, if you really want your child to come, and I did this with both my boys, I'd keep a little treat jar around. And I would ask them to come, and they'd come in. And every third time randomly, I'd give them a treat and then say, go right back out and start playing again. So they really never knew. They really never knew. We had them discuss their rewards they've selected for their child. And then we, we teach them what's called differential attention or proximity praise. Differential attention from a parent works with a behavior that is really rewarded by attention. And so uh, differential attention, we teach the parent to ignore the child when they're misbehaving and then catch the child the moment they stop and start being appropriate again and using I feed AV rules. So you, you ignore the inappropriate behavior and you catch the first good behavior and then we really warn them, get ready because you're going to get an extinction burst. It's going to go up. And um, there's also one called proximity praise. The same thing. Uh, differential attention is with one child. One child misbehaves, you wait for them to be appropriate. Proximity praise is if you have children at the dinner table, let's say, and one is misbehaving and one is appropriate. Before you reprimand the child that's uh, inappropriate, you reward the child that's being appropriate. And it is incredible what the research says, how quickly the misbehaving child will generally come back on point and be appropriate. And then we teach them about behavioral momentum. And behavioral momentum is if you want your child to comply and do something, 
ask them two things they like to do, and then ask them things they don't want to do. Now, these are just some of the things in this chapter that we go through here. Oh, let me see if I can get this working. Uh, this is differential attention. Pay attention to good. Ignore the bad. We go through it, basically. And then we give them tips. It's really hard for parents to, to ignore their child, break eye contact and look away. And down there I had one mother who I just loved in the parent training group that said when she needed to ignore it, she vacuumed, you know. And she said she knew she had her child when he finally just sat on the vacuum and she said, good sitting on the vacuum, okay. I had another parent who was part of a choir and when she needed to ignore the child, she would start to sing, okay. So it helps to make a video on this because the concept's a little difficult for parents to get across. And it helps to role play it if you want. This is the one area that it really may help to role play, particularly with you starting off if you've got a co-facilitator and then ask parents if they want to try. Number four, we move into the really heavy duty non-compliance issues. And this is getting your child to mind without losing yours. And this is where we introduce coercion, which is an eye opener to most parents, and precision requests. Now coercion is, as you can see in this diagram, the parent asks the child to do something, the parent ignores, I mean, the child ignores the request, the parent gives a rationale, uh, the child, you know, employs a delay strategy, just wait a minute, parent gets upset, yells at the child, the child starts to argue, uh, parent threatens the child, the child throws a fit, it says here, starts a temper tantrum. Now what happens, what happens in 60% in of these situations, with tough kids is the parent will withdraw the request because the child is so adversive. And the moment you withdraw that request, every one of those adversive behaviors are rewarded and reinforced. And so we're gonna take this apart in two ways. One is called antecedent control, and the other one is called consequential control. Antecedent control is the first best way to do it because an antecedent is anything that comes just before the behavior and sets the occasion for it. And if the behavior is temper tantrum or arguing, if the antecedent is there, we like to say to the parents, it's you. And there's certain things you can do to get better compliance without having yet to go to a consequence, which is number one, get close to your child, three feet, make eye contact with your child. Don't use a question format like wouldn't you like to or, or how about it. Don't use a vague comment with the child. You can only ask twice and you have to remain calm. And we boil this down into what's called a, a precision request sequence. And this sequence is a two-step sequence where the parent says, please give the request, wait three to five seconds. If the child does not comply, if the child complies, we reward them. If the child does not comply, we have a signal phrase. And the signal phrase can be a lot of different things. Here it's, now, now this is an, a, a, a direction. And you forewarn the child, when you say that phrase, this is the direction. They have three to five more seconds to comply, or you'll follow through with an unpleasant consequence that they will not like, and then you'll still require them to follow through with the original request. Precision requests make a huge difference. You can get a 30% increase out of a child by just changing the parent the way they ask or, or request uh, a behavior from a child. Chapter five, we go into timeout. And this is a very controversial area for some, for some individuals. But when we look at the meta-analyses on timeout, if it's done well, there's actually benefits to timeout. And we give them a step-by-step -step approach on how to do this. And the first thing we do is we develop a set of house rules to say, now, if you break these rules and I give you a precision request twice, you know, I will time you out. And we like to set very specific rules and I like number four because I like dogs and cats, and I've seen a lot of dogs and cats mistreated over the years by different tough kids. And uh, we define what timeout is. Timeout is taking you out of a rewarding environment or altering that environment. And you cannot be timed out of a non-reinforcing environment. So if the kid is not doing his homework, timing them out is generally not going to work. It has to be a rewarding environment. And we give what time it, what timeout is and isn't. It's not a place, you know, it's, it's a period of time from rewarding environment, it's safe, you know, and you receive no attention. And then there's step-by-step -step, uh, sequences in the book on how do you do this in the home. We have a timeout log. This is another component for us, uh, the timeout log to see how 
it, how it, it's really working. If timeout does not go down, you have to change it. And that's the biggest mistake clinicians make with timeout is they stick with it for too long a period of time. You have to make adjustments with timeout. And that's within a week or two weeks. If the behavior is not going down, you're not doing it correctly. And then we move to chapter six, which is time jam places and public places. This is where the child's uh, engaging in misbehaviors and you're in a public place, which is very difficult to time them out. And we've done a lot of work in this area over the years. The first one up there is called marking time. We get our parents to put a little uh, masking tape on their wrist. And if the child is misbehaving, like say in a grocery store, you can make a mark down and say, okay, when I go home, each one of these marks is going to be two minutes of time out. What I love to see, and there's research on this, is if the kid is having a temper tantrum, you need to probably get into an aisle in a grocery store where it's not too inhabited, like the institutional food aisle, and just click on your phone and say, you know, start videotaping the child and say, you know, when we go home, I'm going to show you this and I'm going to time you out at home. What I really like is I owe you a no, which is if you're going to do this to me in public, I owe you a no. And so what we try to do is encourage parents to get a three by five card and a magnet. On one side of the card, they write a yes. On one side of the card, they write a no. And if the child, it's always a yes, but if the child misbehaves at grandma's or the grocery store, when you come home, you flip it around to no. And then you wait for the child to ask you for something that they really want. And you say, let's go check the card, the, the yes, no card, and see what it is. Do I owe you a no or do I owe you a yes? Roland Nichols tricks in the book, uh, if you're in cars with kids for a long period of time, it's where you give them a roll of nickels and you withdraw a nickel every time they misbehave. Uh, and the, the next one is not in the book, but I love this one. It's, I own your device. If you misbehave in public or at grandma's, the computer you like, uh, uh, the video game that you like, I own it and we teach parents to do this. And this is a really cool thing. We've done this a million times which is, this is your, your cord, you go to, you know, Home Depot, buy a little tool chest lock, lock it through there, the child's not going to be able to plug it in, and you have the key until the child uh, earns that right back. Uh, now, the second part of this group also is habit builders. And habit builders are things that you want to build in every day that the child can do that's going to be really, really uh, uh, positive for them over time. You want to turn them into habits. And you can see things down here. When I get home from school, I call mom. Read five pages. A lot of this came off of my boy's habit charger uh, chart. We have them read five pages, not not five minutes, because they can sit there and, you know, and, and, and while away five minutes. But five pages is, is is a good approach. Unload the dishwasher. Clean the room. You know, you don't clean the room every day. So we generally have that twice. Feed the dog, we generally have down there because pets are responsibility. And if the child does these chores or duties or habits by a certain time, 7 p.m., we have a reinforcement system for them. Now, these are actual my boy's habit charts of years ago brushing teeth, cleaning the room, five pages, put my plate away, plate away special contract, here's the other ones. And they were under a, a cellophane little folder thing so we could use a, a basic washable marker. Now, what we really shine in the Tough Kid materials are the reinforcement systems. If you've got your, your habits, your duties done by 7 p.m., you might get a mystery motivator, which is an incentive written in a down and put inside of an envelope with a question mark on it, put on the refrigerator. And we deliver these in a lot of different ways. This is one I really have loved and we've used it thousands of times. And the mystery motivator is in the uh, PDF in the back of the book. What we do is we tape that, that envelope to this sheet and uh, the, it, the incentive is inside the envelope. Then we take these magic pens over here when the child's not present. And you can see on the right end, they're clear ink, and we'll put X's in there. If the child does his work by 7 p.m., we let him color that in. If a color appears, they get the mystery motivator, and we make that random. We make it random. This is another one I, I love, which is done well. And that, there's actually on the Internet you can get 
you can get uh, apps for a, a spinner like this, but we generally make them, and if the child finishes their work by, by 7 p.m., we let them spin the spinner, and whatever it lands on, they get. And you can see, number one, it's much smaller than number four, and that can be a far more valued reward than number four is. And then we put a mystery motivator in there also. Uh, chart moves are the same where we use those, those pens, but it looks like a snake, and in here is an X where they color it in and see if they're going to reward it. Now, solutions to common tough kid problems. One of the issues we said is parents being able to generalize these skills to new problems. And what we like to do is use an ABC replacement model. And if you're a behavior analyst, you recognize this right away as the ABC functional assessment model. We never tell it's a functional assessment, but it is. But we say, if you have a new problem, we'd like you to put down what happens just before that problem, what that problem behavior is, what the consequences are that follows it, and is there a replacement behavior that we could teach your child so they wouldn't have to engage in the inappropriate behaviors. And we give them the template for this, of antecedents, new behaviors and consequences, and replacement behaviors. And then we run them through a whole series of, of probable problems that are going to come up. And you can see the ABC models on the left there. Going to bed on time is one. I love the tough kid there because he's got skull crossbones on his pajamas. Uh, cleaning the room is another one. And the Sunday box is a technique we use that if you leave your toys out, uh, I'll, or clothing out, and I've asked you to pick them up and you don't, I'll put them in the Sunday box and you won't get them back till Sunday. Sibling fighting, again, cruelty to animals, being inappropriate in the car. Uh, lower left-hand side is the babysitter. Uh, it's just a fact of life. Some of these kids are going to steal, and they're going to steal money from you. So we have a program for that, uh, and if they engage in substances, smoking, alcohol, or whatever. And it really helps a lot to have that ABC model. And then there's a whole other series of, of issues also, common issues that I haven't gone through yet here, okay? All right, I've got to hurry up here. Now, this is making the homeschool connection. I'm really proud of this because this is something that not – I know of no other programs that have this. But we have a section in here on how to talk to your teacher about your child having difficulties, how not to make them feel defensive. We can run them through there. Then we like to build up a home note that goes from home to school and school to home, which builds in that information link with the teacher. They are used by 60% of schools in the United States, and they have an incredible research background on effectiveness. Then we have a homework program, how to be a tutor, and teacher pleasers, which is, a, I'll go through that in just a second. But this is our standard home note, and they're in the back of the book. And this is for secondary because it's got different periods and different subjects as you go through it. There's an elementary one also. Trouble with home notes is they get lost or they get altered by the child. So just last year, me and my graduate students developed an electronic home note system. And this is really sweet. It takes about three seconds to fill out. The teacher fills it out on an iPad. It goes immediately to the, to the parent by uh, uh, Gmail. And then to the school psychologist, school counselor, social worker, special ed teacher, but it also puts all the data in an Excel sheet and charts the behaviors for you automatically so you can see if your program is working or not over time. This one has just really worked out really well for us, and we're just getting the first paper published on it that we did. We haven't set up a home, uh, no, uh, not a home, a homework program, and we've got a lot of, a lot of area and research in this. As a matter of fact, one of my uh, graduate students won the Dissertation of the Year Award from the American Psychological Association for our work with uh, homework. But you've got to pick the right spot. You've got to have everything there. You've got to pick a schedule. And if the kid says, I don't have homework, you still have to stick with that schedule and have them do something else. Motivation system, you know, you have to know what has to be done. So that link with the home note, you should build in there what homework is needed and when is it needed and what tests are coming up. And then we have them also, we teach them how to be tutors because we did some work in, in having parents as tutors like reciprocity reading, particularly reading. And we really emphasize you take baby steps, just like Bill Murray in What About Bob. Baby steps work. I mean, you have a schedule. You make it positive. You have the child help you select whatever books or materials you're doing. You remind them before tutoring so that they're not shocked by it. And you really have a high praise rate as you go through there. 
And then we have a little teacher pleaser program in here and just a little social skills that a parent can set up, have their child prompted to do, like say thank you or asking politely because a lot of our kids go back with very bad reputations and there's a full set of these teacher pleaser uh, uh, programs in the back of, the, uh, of this uh, new edition of the Tough Kid book. It's all laid out there in far more detail. So um, this is just what we ran with our parents. As I said, 35 years after every year, we'd run it. This was one of the early ones. And I'm sure you can't see it very well, but you can sure download the slides. What they really liked was a sense of humor, the practicality of it, and the interventions they liked the most were knowing about temperament, coercion, precision requests, and positive reinforcement and learning how to do it time out effectively. 99% of our parents would recommend this group and it got an average of 4.9 and that's over the years. So, and here's just a little research we did. Oh, the upper panel is three very non-compliant children we had at the University of Utah clinic here and we tracked them with parents and running the parents through this and you can see it going down. But the true acid tests for me and our parenting materials. These are comments from Amazon and these are non-solicited, never to these people, they bought the materials and what's really great about it, and I'll let you read it because I'm running out of time here, but it's, you know, uh, one parent says, this book kept me from sending my, my child back to the hospital for, you know, behavioral issues. Uh, I use this, this program with my, my whole family, children, uh, you know, where was this before? I wish I'd have had it 13 years before, but you can look it up on Amazon if you want and read that yourself. And that's, that's it, Nick. I'm done. Can we open it up for questions? Yes, all right. So if you have any questions, please send them in the Q&A or in the chat box, and I'm going to read a few that we have gotten. Um, first one, Bill. Any suggestions for getting parents to sign up for parenting training or continuing to participate? I'm having difficulties getting parents to even come to parent training. Yeah, I think you have to make a pitch for it and teach them, you know, you have to let them know, like if you can go to a PTA or if you can go to parent-teacher conference night and have five minutes with the, with the parents and show them it's going to be positive, it's going to be practical, you really would like their support and uh, it's going to be educative and fun. What was interesting about it is I had one parent one year tell me, uh, and fathers often say this, I was going to come with her only once to the first parent training, then I wasn't going to come anymore. But he says, you're funny, it's practical, and I love this part. He says, we make it date night out now, and we go to the oyster bar happy hour before we come up, and I have a couple of glasses of wine. But you have to sell it that way. You can sell it also in teaching practical skills um, in, a, in a leaflet, uh, and that makes a difference. Getting them to come back, as I said, attrition is your worst enemy. You got to make it enjoyable. You can't make them feel guilty about it. You have to you know, tailor it to, to their times. Uh, the night before call, a newsletter that falls up, and then realizing you're still going to probably lose about 20% of your parents. But it is the bane of, of parent training. Uh, you can also pass the book around and tell them they're going to get a book. Parents will do a lot if they think they're going to get a book or be able to to use the book. But there is no silver bullet, which there were. All righty, next question. In the beginning, you mentioned the length of parent training series. Do you have a perfect length that you're used to using? Six weeks, eight <laughs> weeks, every two weeks, every week? It really depends on the functioning level of your parents. You know, when we ran it at Primary Children's Hospital and parents were paying like $300 to come to it and they were, they were very, you know, upperly socially mobile parents, we could get by with six weeks. They would read everything, they were very motivated. For insular mothers that have a lot on their plate and they're really punished by society, and we try to build in that social aspects, you know, 10 or 12 times. And we might b go 10 weeks and then wait two weeks and have two boosters with it, trying to use that ABC model that went with it. The average probable median time would be eight weeks, and that's why the book has eight chapters in it. All righty. Uh, here's a comment, not a question. I'm so glad you've republished this. I use it as a manual. I'm a behavior analyst and was bummed when it disappeared. So thank you, Tara. Oh, that's nice to hear. That's very nice to hear. All righty. So we're going to leave it open for any other questions to come in. Um, please send them now. One question that we've gotten a few times is where to purchase the book. 
The best place to purchase the book is at Pacific Northwest Publishing. So the website is PacificNWPublish.com. But our website's down today, so we're having issues with our website. I will make sure that once that website is up and working, I'll email everybody in, uh, who's here today with a link directly to the book. Uh, Nick, let me say one thing here. Please don't buy it from Amazon. Uh, they're charging $58 for this book now. And it's not, you know, Pacific Northwest has a, a much better price break on this. That, that's robbery in my view. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Let's see. Um, is there a teaching manual with the curriculum for the groups? Oh, I wish you hadn't have asked that. <laughs> there is. It's going to be a facilitator's manual. I'm about halfway through it. I was not supposed to mention it. But yes, it will go through the basic standards of how to run this program. And that should be out hopefully by summer or fall. And again, I apologize to Pacific Northwest because they asked me not to get everyone's expectations up about this. But there will be one definitely. All righty, no worries. Um, Bill, do you have any materials for parenting children who are on the spectrum? I feel that there are many different aspects for this type of child. There's a lot of, there's several good books out there. One by, by Gina Green, I think is an excellent book that's out there. Um, I think this sort of approach helps a great deal, all right? We use precision requests and what we call the get ready response with um, ASD children. And I started the autism program in Utah 35 years ago, the Pingree Center for Autism now. And uh, precision requests, getting ready, are really fundamental skills for these kids to have. And these skills are in the components of our superhero social skills training program. And what's been interesting about the superhero social skills training program is we had one dissertation where we started to teach the first two social skills, which number one was get ready, second one was following directions. Then we had parents teach the social skills training program. And they taught them in teams of three, and they would alternate who was in charge. So you might want to look at this program. It's, it's fairly expensive, but if it's a school bought one and they lent it to different parents, what happened with the parents that taught the social skills training is that not only did they learn to manage their children better, their, their depression scores dropped, their, their sense of helplessness dropped when we published this paper, and they built up a real comradeship between themselves and, you know, linked on Facebook. So that's another way to look at it. All righty. Thank you, Bill. So uh, I've gotten the question if the webinar will be recorded and shared. Yes, it will. It takes about a day for me to get the recorded webinar up, and we'll email everybody when it's up. I believe with that, those are all the questions I've got. So with that, we will uh, close the webinar. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you very much. And we'll make sure to send out an email with uh, some of the links that we talked about, a link to the product, the webinar. And um, Bill, if you send me that info on the social skills book, I'll, I'll include that. But you know, that's, that's published by Pacific Northwest, so they have it right there. Okay, I think I know the one you mean then. I'll ask, yeah, I'll super, work with Sarah and find heroes. it. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Nick, how did the sound work? <laughs>